So artificial intelligence has been without a doubt one of the most newsworthy topics of 2023 thus far. You've got ChatGPT that's blowing everyone's minds and making people wonder, is this going to take over our jobs? And it seems every day there's some new AI technology that's coming out that's catching everyone's attention. So I decided to try and take some of these technologies and apply them to the stock market and see if I could accurately train an AI to predict stock prices. Now you may be thinking, Eric, what are you talking about? There's no way that you just trained an AI to accurately predict stock prices. I mean, there's hedge funds out there that spend millions and millions of dollars on technology that can do all kinds of things. For example, they can web scrape social media sites and look at sentiment analysis on these sites and then use that to try and predict sales sales trends in companies and there's a hedge fund out there that is sending satellites into space to take images of oil containers and use that to predict the price of oil and you know you're just some guy on YouTube right so what do you know and you are kind of right on that I am just some guy on YouTube and to be honest if I did train an artificial intelligence model to precisely predict stock prices then the last thing I would do is share it here on YouTube for the world to see so if all of that is true then what's the point of this video well for me I was very curious to see what would happen if we trained an AI algorithm to optimize for stock price performance that was trained purely on financial numbers based objective data because let's be honest, we humans are emotional creatures. We're full of biases, whether we like to admit or not. And especially when it comes to something like investing, we often fail to make rational decisions. I mean, they've done experiments where a monkey that picks stocks by throwing darts at a dartboard performs better than most professional money managers. Now, I do agree that sound investing is about more than just simply looking at numbers. You have to understand many things like competitive dynamics within a given industry, consumer behavior, and market psychology to an extent as well. All these different things. But if this AI does tell us that, objectively speaking, certain metrics companies can have will, on average, lead to better returns, then to me, I think that is a very interesting insight. So that's what I want to share with you today. So first, I want to explain in very simple terms how this whole AI thing works and how we determined what financial metrics to use as part of our training data set. So the AI that we used is one called Dynet, and it's actually a machine learning neural network, which is a specific type of AI. So how it works is we first had to determine input parameters to use for something called an input layer. And these input parameters are just the financial metrics that you would use to evaluate companies. And most of these are just really, you know, basic financial metrics anyone can look up for a company, some of which are going to be valuation based, like a price to book value ratio, some of which are purely financial, such as profit margin. And we also included macroeconomic metrics such as interest rates, GDP growth, because these are very, very important metrics that influence an entire economy. For example, when interest rates go up, stock tend to go down. When the economy is growing, stocks tend to grow along with it. So it's definitely necessary to include these when training the neural network. But the key here is that these inputs will be different for each round of training data. And when I say round, I mean the financial metrics for a specific stock at a specific point in time. For example, we could have Microsoft in June of 2015 as one of the examples of the training data. So what happens next is the neural network takes these input parameters and then it goes through a series of hidden layers. And these hidden layers will each have a coefficient associated with them. And this coefficient, it starts out as just a completely random number. So the input parameters get multiplied by this random coefficient at each hidden layer to generate this very large number, which at first it looks kind of random. So that's all the AI network is really doing. It's just taking our inputs, multiplying them by these coefficients, and then spitting out a number which at first starts out as just a random number. But it's what it does next, which is where the learning part of machine learning actually takes place. It then looks at what the actual one year return was for that specific stock, and then subtracts that very large random number from the actual realized return to generate something called an error. And its goal with future training data sets is to try and reduce this error to as little as possible by changing the coefficients that it multiplies the input parameters by throughout those hidden layers that I talked about before. So as it runs through more and more sets of training data for different companies in different time periods, it becomes better and better at predicting this error until it gets to a point where it's actually reasonably accurate at predicting future one-year returns based purely on financial data. 
And by the way, for our training data, we used all the stocks that are listed on the New York Stock Exchange, the NASDAQ, and the TSX that have a market cap of at least 100 million US dollars, which is around 4,000 or so companies. And we took a new set of data once per month going back 10 years. So each time collecting a new set of input parameters uh, for those different companies. And we were looking to optimize for the one year stock price performance for each company. Okay, so now let's actually dive into the results of this. So for this, I'm gonna split it into two parts. The first part is going to be looking at how accurate the AI actually was at predicting stock prices. And the second part is going to be looking at what qualities companies have that the AI eventually learned to prefer in companies by giving those companies a higher predicted return. So for example, does it prefer smaller companies over larger companies? Does it prefer cheap stocks over expensive stocks? Things like that, because with this AI, as great as it is, it is a bit of a black box where we don't know exactly why it may be saying one company will have a 50% return over the next year and another company will have a negative 50% return over the next year. So we do have to do some data analysis to figure this out. And I did also add a page on my website where you can go there and you can enter any stock you want and it will tell you what the current predicted one year return is for that stock. So if you're curious to see what the AI thinks of certain stocks that you own, then feel free to go to my website. It's called tickernomics.com. The link will be in the description and then click profit ROI at the top. That's the name that I've given this thing. Just obligatory reminder that this certainly should not be construed as financial advice. So do not go out there and just start buying stocks based on what this AI is telling you. This is very experimental right now. So basically what I have here is some data on how good this thing is at making accurate predictions. And the way I tested this is I looked at what the AI predicted for each company as of one year ago, and then looked at what the actual returns ended up being over that year to see how accurate it was. And as far as the accuracy goes, these stats are pretty incredible, I think. So I looked at two things mainly. One was seeing how often the AI predicted the direction correctly. So whether the stock went up or down. And amazingly, just slightly over half the time, the AI correctly predicted the direction. We can see here 50.32% of the time, which to me, that's pretty remarkable, right? In a way that's basically saying that when it comes down to analyzing companies and trying to predict stock prices, about half of that decision comes down to the financials, the objective numbers-based data. And then I also wanted to see how often it predicted within 50% of the actual return. So for example, if the AI predicted a 10% return, how often is the actual return between 15 and 5%? So 50% higher or 50% lower. And for that, it was 14.3% of the time. So that may seem low, but to me, I think that's pretty good overall. Now, one interesting pattern that I noticed is that the more extreme the predicted returns were, the more accurate the predictions actually became. So if we look at this chart here, we can see on this axis, I have the ranges of predicted returns. So there's some that were above 100%, some as low as negative 50%. This blue line represents the percentage of the time that the direction was correctly predicted, and then this orange is the percentage of the time it was within 50% of the actual return. And we can see that at the more extreme ranges, the predictions are more accurate. For example, when it was predicted to be negative 50%, it got the direction correct about 75% of the time, and then about 25% of the time it was within 50%, and then when it was above 100%, we can see 80% of the time it predicted the direction accurately. And there's kind of just a general V shape, right? Where once we get into the ranges of negative five to positive 10%, it's a bit more ambiguous and the AI wasn't quite as accurate for those ranges. So all of this got me thinking, what if we had created a portfolio of stocks that had very high predicted returns? And the results of this are quite interesting, I think. So I have this chart here, which shows the predicted return cohorts along here. So we can see again, over 100% predicted return, 85 to 100. 70 to 85, etc., all the way down to negative uh, 50% here. And then each bar represents what the average returns were for companies within those cohorts. And it's pretty interesting to see that, you know, as they get more and more negative, the average returns are you know, usually pretty negative. So it's generally quite accurate at that. And then we can also see once we get into the more extreme ranges of positive returns, the average returns are actually quite high. For example, this 70 to 85% range here had an average return of 51.9%, which is extremely high. So I looked at a few things here 
One was, what if we had bought a market cap weighted basket of stocks that had predicted returns of at least 15%, and that would have been just under a 6% return. So not really that good, right? But what if we had bought, you know, again, the same thing, a market cap weighted basket of stocks with predicted returns in this one range here of 70 to 85%, it would have been a about a 42% annual return, which is extremely high. But then again, we wouldn't have known that specifically this range would have been the best performing one. And that could have just been the case for this one year. We don't know if that will be the case going forward. But what if we had bought a market cap weighted basket of stocks with predicted returns at least 70%? Our returns would have been just under 38% for the year, which is still, that is extremely high. So all of that is very cool. But for me personally, what I was more interested in seeing is what specific metrics the AI learned to prefer more than others. And I had a few expectations of what I thought I would see going into this, but let's actually look at some data to see what ended up happening. And we have many different metrics that we used to train this data set, but what I do want to focus on is a few specific ones that I think are particularly interesting. So I put together a few different scatter plots here, and each dot on this scatter plot represents a different company. And this one, for example, is looking at the price to earnings ratio versus what the predicted returns are for each company. And we can see with this trend line that goes through it that there is a slight bias towards lower price to earnings ratios. So companies with lower PEs generally will have slightly higher predicted returns. It's not a very steep trend line, but it's one that we can observe here, which is really what I would expect to see going in, into this. Generally, cheaper stocks make better investments. Lower price to earnings ratio is one of the most clear cut ways to tell that a stock is cheap because in a way you're just paying less for that company's earnings. So it was interesting to see here that the AI did learn over time to prefer stocks with lower price to earnings ratios. But obviously, Obviously there is some variance and this is just one metric. Let's move to another one to see what else we can learn. Now this scatter plot here is looking at market cap. So does it generally prefer companies with larger market caps or smaller market caps? And you may think that you know this doesn't really matter, but there is you know some academic research in the investing space that seems to indicate that on average smaller companies will have higher returns than larger companies. So I was curious to see if the AI would learn that this is actually true, and it appears that again, up to a very slight extent it has, because we can see as this trend line that goes through the data, it points up into the left, which means as the market cap gets smaller, the predicted returns generally get larger. So it does seem that the AI learned to prefer smaller market cap companies versus larger ones. But again, there is going to be plenty of variance in here as this is just one variable in the many that we used. Now, what about the debt to equity ratio? This one was a little bit more ambiguous where there's really no discernible pattern as the trend line is roughly flat. But what I did expect to see is that companies that would have a lower debt to equity ratio would have higher predicted returns because in theory, you're buying a more financially sound company, a company that has less debt on their balance sheet relative to their equity. But it turns out this one doesn't really tell us that much. Okay, so now let's move into some that showed a much stronger positive relationship. So the one that I thought was the most striking was the dividend yield. So yes, dividend investors around the world rejoice. It does seem that the AI learned to prefer companies that have higher dividend yields and to just prefer companies that pay dividends overall. And I've talked about this numerous times in past videos that in my opinion, I think the reason that dividend investing tends to do quite well over long periods of time is because really it's just a more disciplined form of investing where you're buying sound companies. Because if a company is able to pay a dividend, it's probably overall a pretty financially strong business with an economic moat and good growth prospects going forward. But it does seem here that the AI learned that dividend investing is the way to go. As we can see, a very clear positive trend here. Another metric that showed a very clear positive trend was beta. So this kind of makes sense as well, where we can see here that a higher beta generally meant a higher predicted return because companies with higher betas are more volatile, right? That's what a higher beta indicates. So companies that are more volatile, most of the time, those are usually more risky companies. And one of the main rules of investing is higher risk equals higher return or higher risk equals the potential for higher return. 
So interestingly enough, it does seem that to an extent, the AI learned to interpret this relationship where higher beta stocks should have higher predicted returns. So anyways, guys, I hope you did find this video as interesting as I did. If you would like to learn how you can access some of the data that I presented throughout this video, then I put instructions on how to do that in the description of this video. And if you have any ideas on future videos that I can do that are AI stock market related, then please drop a comment in the comment section and I will check and see if it's doable. But with that in mind, I hope you enjoyed and I'll see you in the next one.